this week. Siskel and Ebert review gambler Robert Redford finding love and danger in Havana. Deborah Winger and John Malkovich trek through Africa in the sheltering sky. And Cher plays Winona Ryder's unconventional mom in the comedy drama Mermaids. It's all coming up next on Siskel and Ebert. $800. You really want this, don't you? Will you do it? Robert Redford is a gambler in revolutionary Cuba who thinks he's a cynic until he falls in love with an idealistic woman. The name of the movie is Havana, one of the new holiday releases we'll be reviewing this week on Siskel and Ebert, along with Awakenings, the new Robin Williams and Robert De Niro movie. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. Our first film is Sidney Pollack's Havana, and although I don't think the central love story really works, I enjoyed this film very much because of its physical qualities and one of Robert Redford's very best performances and roles. In Havana, set in the last days of the Batista regime in 1958, before Castro and his rebels took over, Redford plays a selfish gambler, a poker player, looking for a big score with the help of casino boss Alan Arkin. I've played every Elks Club and Moose Hall in America, Joe. And I remember every hand of every game. And now I want a shot. One shot. Into his life comes a beautiful woman married to a wealthy revolutionary. Lena Olin plays the woman who Redford tries to pick up. I keep a place here. Small flat. But it's in one of the really old buildings, a lot of charm. Discreet. You're very straightforward, aren't you, Mr. Wyatt? Well, I... Hey, I can be suave. Believe me. Uh, but I figure you know a lot of suave guys. Eventually, he meets her husband, played by Raul Julia. Redford, having helped them smuggle contraband into Cuba, is solicited again for more help. Perhaps you do believe in something, after all. Perhaps you believe in beautiful women, Mr. Wyatt. His choice between his lifestyle and an unselfish cause is similar, of course, to the choice Bogart had to make in Casablanca. And Havana has the same adult sensibility as that classic film. It also looks great, and Redford is absolutely convincing in his less-than-glamorous role. He really looks his age here. Only during the final political machinations of the story was this script's credibility strained for me. Otherwise, I really enjoyed spending time in Havana. I did, too. I enjoyed spending time in Havana. Now, Sidney Pollack shot this movie in the Dominican Republic right. and on sets, but he does a wonderful job of recreating this. Yes moment right before the revolution the, the scenes of the the crazed gamblers in the casino knowing that everything's going to end at midnight or in in a few hours right. and trying to gamble and trying to get lucky one thing that i think is weak about the movie is the raul julia character in casablanca which this is practically a remake of the whole thing depends upon Paul Honreid being seen as a really heroic figure so that we believe that Ingrid Bergman is getting on the plane with the right person. Now here, I'll tell you, Raul Julia is not given enough screen time or enough dialogue or enough political weight to make him seem that compelling, so it's not necessarily as clear at the end whether we agree with the choice that's made or not. Well, that's why I said that the film really focuses as a study on the Redford character. Mm -hmm. I think that if you dropped, oddly enough, if you dropped away all the other characters, it would still be a fascinating story because here's a guy who is thought only of himself he sees a chance to do the right thing mm -hmm. you know one final grasp for making his life mean something and and i was caught up in in that battle inside himself well i think it's a good movie our next film is named mermaids and this is one of the stranger and more offbeat films of the year starring Cher in a story set in 1963 about a woman named mrs flax who has had bad luck with men, starting with Mr. Flax, if in fact there ever was a Mr. Flax, and it moves to another town, taking her two daughters with her whenever another relationship busts up. At the last count by her teenage daughter, that has been at least 18 times. The daughter is played by Winona Ryder. This is her third alienated teenager role in about a month, and unlike her mother, she's completely ignorant about sex. You know, I'm always just, I'm too embarrassed to take a shower after gym. 
Mary O'Brien, she dances around naked, screaming about her boyfriend's quivering loins. Shut up, Charlotte. Shut up. Life starts to change for the Flax family when they walk into a shoe store run by Bob Hoskins. He's a reliable, salt-of-the-earth type who can see instantly they need a little more routine in their lives. And so he comes to breakfast one morning, only to discover that Cher's idea of cooking is to devise colorful arrangements of fun foods. Who's Kate's father? Are you always this, this nosy? nosy? I'm a small town boy. I like to know other people's business. Do you mind? No, when I mind, you'll know I mind. It's kind of obvious. So who was he? Well, actually, I never caught his name. He came to St. Louis for a swim meet, and if he won, he was headed for the Olympics. You were on the same team? No, I was the maid in his hotel. And one night, I delivered more than his towels. Will Cher finally find happiness with this man? She will if her daughter has anything to say about it. Look, maybe your life works for you, but it doesn't work for me. And I want to stay! And do what? Finish high school! Great. I think that's good acting. There's an undercurrent of craziness running through this movie that never quite surfaces, and it's hard to know how to deal with it. Mrs. Flax is not just a colorful eccentric. She has real problems, and her daughter is almost willfully looking for an escape route. The fact that mermaids persist in treating them as colorful and lovable types is sort of perverse, but it's sort of entertaining, too. What's intriguing is the way the performances, especially by Cher and Winona Ryder, stubbornly insist on the perversities of their peculiar characters, even while the movie seems to be going for a happy ending. Mermaids is not a very likable film, but I liked it. And I didn't, Roger, and I think it's just what you said, that uh, it portrays these people as colorful and lovable. Everybody has the snappy repartee. Um, I know that, that obviously parents and children have problems, but why not play this for real? We have really fine actors working here, mm -hmm. but I just thought that everything was wrapped up in a sweet Hollywood script writing bow, um, and uh, <laughs> If they, if they just had a natural moment, if they just relaxed one time, if she didn't make the, the uh, breakfast entrees and all these cute uh, little fun foods, I mean, if, can't they just have a natural well, moment? Well, I, I don't even object to the fun foods. I think that's kind of a character oh, it detail. It keeps coming on yeah, okay, and on and over it. I think what times. we have here is Hollywood's inexorable push toward imposing a happy Cute. ending on material where it's totally inappropriate. Now, what I liked about the movie is that the characters, Mrs. Flax and her daughter, played by Winona Ryder in particular, go their own way. They make their own movie, which has truth in it, even while Richard Benjamin, the director, and presumably the screenwriters, are going a different direction in order to give us uh, this kind of sitcom-y resolution that doesn't have anything to do with who these people are. Winona Ryder is a really fine talent. She's in Edward Scissorhands right now. Uh, she even was the best thing in Welcome Home, Roxy Carmichael, a pretty bad film. But boy, she's really saddled, I think, with a really cutesy pie script, the same for Cher. Coming up next, Deborah Winger in the desert drama The Sheltering Sky, and later Robin Williams as doctor to the catatonic Robert De Niro in Awakenings. Now, when I sense you begin to move the pointer, I'll stop and you take over. Do you understand? Tunner, we're not tourists, we're travelers. Oh. What's the difference? A uh, tourist is someone who thinks about going home the moment they arrive. Whereas a traveler might not come back at all. That's a scene from The Sheltering Sky, the latest film by Bernardo Bertolucci, whose last picture, The Last Emperor, won him Best Director and the film itself Best Picture of the Year. It's an ambitious failure, I think, this film, The Sheltering Sky, based on Paul Bowles' novel about an American couple with a troubled marriage after 10 years traveling in the African desert in order to find themselves. One of the problems, they aren't very appealing, particularly the man, a major whiner played by John Malkovich. Deborah Winger plays his less restless wife. Timbuktu, El God, doesn't make any difference. But if you'll be happier or feel better, then we'll go to El God. The principal pleasure of the movie, the desert scenery, as Deborah Winger is finally off on her own. <laughs> the picture improves somewhat with Malkovich's character out of the way, as Winger loses herself with a young Arab. The desert and Deborah Winger's passion are the only things that recommend this movie. It's not easy, of course, to film alienated characters in a compelling fashion, and I don't think Bertolucci has succeeded at all. Maybe we needed to meet these characters earlier in their relationship in order for us to care about what happens to them on this trip. 
All during this film, I kept thinking of a better film on a similar subject, Michelangelo Antonioni's The Passenger with Jack Nicholson looking for himself in an African location. Rent that one, I think, instead of seeing The Sheltering Sky. I was also disappointed in this movie and disappointed despite the fact that the technical credits were uniformly good. The right. desert hasn't looked this sensational since Lawrence of Arabia. Sure, sure. But I think the problem goes all the way back to the original novel, which is a novel I love very much by Paul Bowles, The Sheltering Sky, which is basically about the insides of people, about the fact that they don't connect, about the fact that they don't connect with each other or with their environment because they're shut down and sterile and, and closed off. And to the degree that he has faithfully filmed the novel, he has made a film that doesn't tell a story that can be told on a movie screen because everything is happening inside the minds of the characters. He doesn't externalize it. Uh, the Malkovich character uh, really, I found, was particularly oppressive. There is a, a life inside Deborah Winger that, uh, that no script can shut down. Yeah. Malkovich uh, has never seemed to be a conventionally appealing person, and certainly there's no glimmer here of anything that would make you well, want to I follow will, him. I will say that he does a very faithful job of creating a character who's just like the character in the book, but there's one problem with the screenplay I can't let pass. His name is Porter in the movie, and she calls him Port. And there's one stretch of about 12 minutes where she uses the syllable port so frequently that it becomes excessive, and then it becomes distracting, and finally it becomes comic. Somebody should have stopped her from saying port, port, port. It, re it really got to me after a while. Okay. When we come back, Robert De Niro plays a man whose mind has been asleep for 30 years until one lucky summer when a doctor finds a way to bring him back in awakenings. When you say people, you mean living people? Mm hmm <clears throat> Well, I'm here to apply for a research position in your neurology lab. That's Robin Williams as a neurologist whose experience has mostly been limited to earthworms until he's hired by a Bronx mental hospital in the new movie Awakenings. Based on a factual book by Oliver Sacks and set in 1969, the movie tells the story of a ward in the hospital that the staff calls the garden because they view the patients there as vegetables to be fed and watered. She has no other living relatives and they say she has always been as she is now, with no response or comprehension. And yet, these patients apparently have not had a conscious thought in years. They're somewhere else, helpless cases, until Williams begins to wonder if an experimental new drug named L-Dopa might help them. Now, you know better than to make a leap like that. You want there to be a connection. That doesn't mean there is one. What I believe, what I know, is these people are alive inside. Massive doses of the drug do seem to bring about a miracle the patients come back to life. And one of the awakened ones who has been in a catatonic state for 30 years since he was 20 years old is played by Robert De Niro. Are you visiting someone? Okay, thanks. Uh, no. You work here? I live here. You're a patient? That's a dollar ain't it? You don't look like a patient. <laughs> One of the movie's best scenes shows De Niro asking to be treated like a real person. Look, I'm not a criminal. I've committed no crime. I'm not a danger to myself or to others. And yet I'm still not allowed to go for a walk on my own by myself. You didn't wake a thing, you woke a person. Awakenings is not only a wonderfully intelligent and emotionally moving film, but a fascinating one at the technical level. The director, Penny Marshall, has the patience to follow along as the doctor pieces together his tiny bits of evidence until it appears he has the answer to a medical mystery. This movie is an intellectual challenge with an emotional payoff. The performances are all right on the money, but I was especially impressed by Robin Williams, who is very disciplined and focused here and does a touching job of creating this man who in his own way is almost as cut off as his patients are. Well, that's interesting. The performance that I liked in the film uh, was the De Niro performance. I loved it. I loved it. And uh, I've had a problem with the Robin Williams mm. character. I watched him when he's, he's a very uptight guy. He can't relate to a, an, another nurse there yeah. who uh, really cares for him and uh, wants to bring out his humanity. And uh, so he's a little tight in force. And I just saw that. Maybe I know Robin Williams from, uh, you know, comedy and from seeing him uh, in other pictures so well that I really didn't buy that, that uptightness. It just seemed to be a little too mechanical for me. And so after I saw this picture even a second time, it, it was more that I, I appreciated what De Niro was doing. He has a real 
sine curve mm -hmm. kind of uh, role here. It's a full uh, performance. The, the uh, ticks that he has uh, don't seem to particularly gimmicky. It seems real. And uh, I ended up caring for him. Well, his the journey. Nero is terrific. In a way, this movie is, has this, follows the same uh, curve as Charlie did more than 20 years ago. A guy who is out somewhere and comes back to us and then leaves again. But I liked Robin Williams very much in this movie. And I criticized him in the Dead Poet Society because I thought I saw some of that uh, well, I some saw, of those mannerisms that we're familiar yeah. with here, I thought we were looking at real acting. Not, not for me this time. At the, at the same time, the film has, has a big heart, and I suppose it, it does make you look at people for their potential rather than for what you think is uh, a lack of potential. Coming up next, Sissy Spacek and Whoopi Goldberg star in The Long Walk Home, a drama about the Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott that really kicked off the civil rights struggle of the 1950s. That bus is as empty as my grave. The year always brings about the most earnest, well-meaning movies, and this year is no exception. Case in point, Awakenings, which we just reviewed, and now The Long Walk Home with Sissy Spacek and Whoopi Goldberg playing two very different women who were politicized by the boycott of public buses by blacks in 1955 Montgomery, Alabama. Goldberg plays Spacek's loyal maid, who is forced to walk some five miles to work each day after blacks begin boycotting buses because they're forced to sit only in the back. Spacek takes pity on Goldberg and begins driving her to work unbeknownst to her husband, nicely played here by Dwight Schultz. But Odessa, you, you're here five days a week. How do you get to work? Today I walked. Uh, I mean, on a normal day. Well, I can't take the bus, Mr. Thompson, so I, I just will find me a ride where I can. Eventually, her husband realizes what's going on after he's joined the oppressive white power structure in town. There's no wonder none of them are riding the buses. They have you to carry them around. Spacek does stand up to her husband, actively joining the boycott, shepherding more blacks, and Goldberg warns her about an even bigger challenge she'll face. About when we start voting, Miss Thompson, because we are. And when we do, we are going to put Negroes in office. What about when the first colored family moves into your neighborhood? This one was a close call for me. A critic always has to be careful in a situation like that. Are you reviewing the cause or are you reviewing the movie? It's obvious to be sure this script, but what I like about it is that it waits a full hour before Spacek is radicalized. Both women underplay their roles. The roles aren't overwritten, and I guess I recommend this story because it makes what may be ancient history to some seem very fresh and important. The, changes that Whoopi Goldberg is talking about right there really register on Sissy Spacek and register in us. A marginal thumbs up for me. Well, there's nothing grudging about my thumb up on this movie. I really loved it. I got emotionally involved in it. I cared about the characters. I cared about the dynamic. Mm -hmm. I liked the performance, for example, of Dwight Schultz. Very good. Spacek's husband who uh, goes through a very interesting change in terms of the drama of the film yes. and I love the relationship between these two women. Another thing I liked is the fact that it isn't just the black maid in the white household, we also see the black household. We yes. see that she has a husband, that she has children, that they're well fed and clothed, that they go to church, that they go to school. These are two mothers trying to raise their families. Uh, the thing that I kept feeling through this picture is, you know, I bet there are people that don't know that blacks were forced to be on the back of a bus. Young moviegoers today, Maybe the film is important for that. It's all long. ancient history to I a lot have of a people, feeling. and yet it's still it's part of our lifetimes. When we come back, our weekly video selection, a western with John Wayne playing one of the three wise men. It's time now for our weekly home video recommendation, and I have a sleeper to suggest to you this week that has finally been released on home video. It's a classic but little seen 1948 western by the great John Ford. It's named Three Godfathers. The Godfathers of the title are rough and tough cowboys, one of them played by John Wayne, and they hardly know what to do when they adopt a baby that's left alone on the prairie after its mother dies in childbirth. If you like Three Men and a Baby, you might actually love this movie, which ends with the Duke looking suspiciously like a frontier version of one of the three wise men in a Christmas scene. It's John Ford's Three Godfathers, and I warmly recommend it. Now let's take another look at the movies we reviewed this week. Two thumbs up for Havana, especially for Robert Redford's strong performance in Sidney Pollack's dramatic recreation of pre-Castro Cuba. 
A split decision on Mermage with Cher and Winona Ryder. We didn't like the happy face style as much as the good performances, but I vote up for the performances. Two thumbs down, though, for The Sheltering Sky, Bernardo Bertolucci's disappointing story about sterile people. Two thumbs up for Awakenings, fascinating subject matter with an emotional payoff. Two more thumbs up for The Long Walk Home with wonderful work by Sissy Spacek and Whoopi Goldberg as two women at the crossroads of American history. So now we have finally some of the good Christmas movies opening after a fairly slow stretch there. The one that I like the best is Havana. And as I was leaving the theater at a preview, a bunch of people said, oh, this is slow. It was slow. Uh, you know, I wonder if people have, have lost touch with a storytelling style that is relaxed, is confidence, a thoughtful character. Mm -hmm. I hope not. It's a strong film. Yeah, if you want to see something that's slow, see The Sheltering Sky. That's it for this week. Next time we'll be back with more big holiday movies, including the spy drama The Russia House with Sean Connery and Michelle Pfeiffer, and the long-awaited film of Tom Wolfe's socio-political portrait of upscale New York City, The Bonfire of the Vanities, with Tom Hanks, Melanie Griffith, and Bruce Willis. That's next week, and until then, the balcony is closed. <laughs>